Welcome everyone to our to the fifth installment of our Computer Science Alumni and Friends Virtual Public Lecture Series, presented by the Department of Computer Science in the Faculty of Science at the University of Regina. First of all, let me extend a warm virtual welcome to members and friends of the University of Regina and its three federated colleges, the First Nations University of Canada, Campion College and Luther College. The University of Regina is situated on Treaty 4 lands with a presence on Treaty 6 lands. These are the territories of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. Today, these lands continue to be the shared territory of many diverse peoples from near and far. So the computer science department at the University of Regina gained final approval in November of 1968. So we celebrated our 50th birthday in November of 2018. Some of the first graduates of the, of the program convocated in 1974 as the University of Saskatchewan Regina campus became the University of Regina. Larry Symes, an, an alumnus of the Regina campus, was the first department head. So I mentioned this is our fifth event in our virtual public lecture series. Look for the next one in sometime in 2023. I welcome your feedback and suggestions. Please send me an email. There's my address, daryl.hefting at uregina.ca. So about our guest today, Dr. Nivergal is the Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of L3 Harris Technologies. He leads the company's engineering technology and corporate strategy organization, including driving the company's overall technology strategy. He joined Harris Corporation in 2017 before their merger with L3 Technologies. And he did that after a long career at Raytheon. Dr. Nivergal has a master's and PhD in math from the University of Notre Dame, Bachelor of Science high, high Honors in Math from the University of Regina. He was born and raised in Saskatchewan. And before joining Raytheon, he served as Associate Professor of Math and Computer Science at the University of Northern British Columbia. So today, Dr. Niebergall will speak to us about the past, present, and future of the space industry. Without any further ado, please help me welcome our speaker. Uh, I'll go on video just to give an introduction and uh... Let me get set up with uh, sharing the screen to uh, to get started. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks, Daryl, for the invitation. I very much appreciate the chance to uh, to talk to people from the University of Regina. I'm a very proud alumnus of uh, University of Regina, and I'm um, happy to be here with you today. So um, I'm I'm hoping that uh, people will have some questions. I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Um, at the end of the presentation, if you want to type them into the chat, uh, even during the presentation, I'll try and follow along and see if there's uh, an opportunity for me to take a look at that and answer the questions. So uh, thanks a lot, uh, Daryl, for giving me what I think is a very generous introduction. Um, as you mentioned, I grew up uh, in Saskatchewan, born in Saskatoon, graduated from high school and university in Regina. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was always very passionate about was space. And that was probably the reason why I went into uh, science in the first place uh, was because of the uh, space program. And when I was a very young boy, my brother would get me out of bed to watch Apollo launches. And, uh, and then I have a distinct memory uh, in, in high school of skipping school to watch the, the first shuttle launch and then skipping school again to actually watch the first shuttle land. And uh, my parents were contacted by the school about that. And, and, and just to show the support that I had from my mother, 
um, she uh, she told the school that uh, you know why wouldn't why wouldn't you show that broadcast in every class the space shuttle launch? So I had a lot of support for uh, my interest in technology, and uh, but I'll be honest that you know growing up in Regina, I didn't really see a great path of getting into the space industry. Um, so what I want to talk about today is kind of the path that uh, that I got there. And uh, and then and then some of uh, what I think is the direction of of the space industry today. So um, to start off, I'll say that I did have the opportunity to finally get into the space industry um, in the early part of this century. So in about uh, 2003, and in 2005, I found myself working uh, while well, at a different company on an extremely large space project. This was launching uh, a satellite that was designed for space observation. Um, it was a, a multi-billion dollar contract. And the history of that program was that it was originally conceived of in 1991. Uh, it was originally contracted in 1993. Um, in 1998, the agency that had contracted it uh, ran out of funding. And so they initially paused the program, ramped it down. And then in 1999, they canceled the program. Um, a few years later, they recognized that this was absolutely mandatory to continue that program. So they restarted the program in 2004. And at that point, you know, I, I'll be honest that um, a lot of the uh, capabilities, hold on. Uh, a lot of the capabilities had been, um, you know, shelved, uh, put into warehouses. Some of the some of the circuit cards were even stored under people's desks, and and it was having to re uh, resurrect all that capability and get the program started again. And that's the program that I started working on. Uh, I was responsible for the software on that satellite. Uh, the software had been started prior to the original contract award in the late '80s. It was written in a language called Ada, um, but I, I suspect most of you are not familiar with Ada, um, and uh, and that was my first introduction to this. Uh, so ultimately, what this looked like was a program that was started in 1991, and I was working on it in 2007, and it was old hardware, old software, old code base, um, and ultimately that satellite wouldn't be launched until uh, 2011. And it just actually went out of commission uh, in uh, 2020. So, you know, my interest in space was, was, I would say, was greatly tarnished by that experience because we're working on old hardware, old equipment, and the cycles of getting something into space took forever. Um, and that was very disillusioning to me. Um, all of that's changed now. Um, you know, and now I'm working at uh, a company that I'll talk more about. Um, we recently actually went from contract award to putting multiple satellites in operation um, in less than 30 months. We actually were ready to launch in less than two years, 24 months of a very sophisticated capability. So what we see is that there's been a massive seismic shift in how, uh, how space operates um, over the last two decades. And uh, and quite honestly, you know, I, I missed that I wasn't around for working on the Apollo era, but but this is a vastly more interesting time to be involved in space today. So I'll go off a of video so we don't have any um, issues with that, uh, and I'll uh, get on to the presentation. So uh, a little bit more background about myself. Um, as Daryl noted, I was educated at the University of Regina and got a PhD in math uh, from the University of Notre Dame. I'll be honest uh, that the reason why I did that was because I thought that mathematicians were unemployable and uh, thought that the only choice that I had was to become a university professor. Um, I did that. I went and got a, a postdoc at McMaster uh, and then ultimately uh, became a professor and got tenure at the University of Northern British Columbia. Um, that was a, a great time in my life, but that said, I was still very interested in the space industry and also building things. Uh, when I got my PhD, I've been offered a job at Bell Labs. Uh, Bell Labs was a vaunted research institute um, uh, that was owned by AT&T originally, and it became part of uh, a new company called Lucent Technologies. 
Um, so I took a leave of absence and left and went to work at uh, Lucent Technologies. And after a year, I decided I wasn't going back to academics. Um, through that time, I was looking at, um, at the opportunity to get into space. And that opportunity came in 2003 when I joined Raytheon and I, I joined exactly the right division that was Space and Airborne Systems. Um, that was where I had my first space experience. It was, I was left underwhelmed to say the least. Um, I left the space business and ultimately uh, went into a number of other organizations in Raytheon before joining L3 Harris in, uh, in 2017. Um, one of the great things about working at L3 Harris is that I also get to live uh, on what's called the Space Coast. Um, so I'm about 10 miles south of uh, Kennedy Space Center. And, uh, and you can see that picture up there. I get, uh, because of the role that I have with the company and because of the, the work that we do, um, I get frequent opportunities to actually go to uh, uh, Kennedy Space Center and witness launches of our satellites. And that was a picture of uh, something called the Gozar satellite launch that I was at uh, with my son. So just giving you, um, you know, I don't want to make this into an advertisement about L3 Harris, but just to give some, some uh, uh, information on uh, the credentials and the credibility that we have, I won't go through this page uh, except to talk about some of our, our technology capabilities. So we have uh, almost 20,000 engineers and scientists um, spread out all over all over the world, really, mostly in the United States. Um, if there's one thing that we are extremely famous for, it is for uh, our, our tactical radios. These are military radios that are either handheld or vehicular or an aircraft. Um, we've delivered uh, many more than one million of those over the past uh, 20 years or so. Um, getting into the space credentials, uh, we actually have 800 on-orbit years, and that's just to give you some context of how many products we have in space and how long that they've been in operation. Um, the reason we got into space in the first place as a company was we had some unique mechanical engineering capabilities that allowed us to build these massive retractable mesh reflectors. So you can think of these things as... Uh, as massive satellite dishes uh, that we launch into space. And, and we currently have uh, a, a few over 100 on orbit right now. Um, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the lower left, and, and that is these uh, EOIR, electro-optical infrared sensors, um, that, that uh, we often, or I often refer to them as the ball turrets that go on aircraft when they're upside down, like the picture shows. Um, and sometimes they can be mounted on vehicles and they can be mounted upright. So these are capabilities that you might see on a helicopter or doing um, ground surveillance uh, uh, from, from the air for, for police or for military uses. I draw your attention to that. Uh, because that's actually a capability that we completely develop and build in Canada. So as a company, we have more than 300, 3,000, I should say, uh, L3 Harris employees uh, across Canada. Uh, most of them are in Ontario, Waterdown, and Toronto. Waterdown is where we have the, the facility that makes these um, surveillance uh, systems. Um, this is obviously a very important time for products like that because they're used extensively in the, in the defense of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, we also have a fairly large facility in Quebec, uh, Montreal and Mirabel, where we do um, uh, modification and, um, and modernization of, uh, of various fleets of aircraft. Uh, we do a lot of manufacturing in Canada. Um, you know, if I look at L3 Harris, roughly, Almost half of our employees are all engineers. Um, in, in Canada, we have about 1,000 engineers, but that's also because we do so much um, aircraft uh, modernization. So that's it for uh, L3 Harris, just to give that background on what we do. And I'm kind of proud of the work that we do in Canada as well. And um, certainly, if, if uh, anybody's interested, um, I think it's a great place to work because they do do a lot of very sophisticated 
um, new development and new capabilities and injecting artificial intelligence and things like that into those capabilities. Okay, so now I wanna move on to space and uh, I'll, I'll start by apologizing initially. Um, uh, I'll start by apologizing initially that some of this is going to be fairly elementary, but I just wanna make sure that I get everybody on the same page with an understanding of, uh, of the capabilities that, that I'm really talking about here. And, um, you know, on the left-hand side of this page, I have a list of what I think are the primary capabilities that that space is used for. So Earth observation, um, this is uh, imagery, you know, the Google Earth kind of pictures of the Earth, weather, um, climate monitoring. Um, next big category is navigation. So this is all, all of the GPS satellites um, that people are generally familiar with, at least uh, know what the acronym is and know what, and know what they do for us. Um, communication, um, in the commercial world, this is you know satellite television, Sirius XM, but now increasingly satellite internet. Um, and then finally, space exploration. So these are the things like uh, the Mars rover, but if I think about satellites, the James Webb telescope, um, and as well as the, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, the interesting thing about those four uh, areas that I put on the left, um, all of them have, all of the top three, I should say, have um, commercial business applications. So, so weather, navigation, communication have business applications. Um, exploration is purely for the advancement of science um, worldwide. So the top three of those have commercial applications, but those top three also have military and defense applications. And, and, and that's where uh, a lot of the change is going on in what we see in, in space technology today. Uh, once again, just to calibrate uh, people's knowledge and understanding of, of how space works, there are fundamentally uh, a number of different orbital regimes. And what I mean by that is you can have things in orbit that are very near to the earth, um, even down to about 400 kilometers or so above the earth. Um, things that are between 400 kilometers and, and uh, 2000 kilometers are what we call low earth orbit or LEO, I will refer to that as. Um, the important thing about that orbital regime is that when you launch a satellite into that, it, it spins around the Earth and actually covers different points of the Earth as it orbits. Um, at the other extreme is geostationary Earth orbit, or what we call geo. And uh, this is positioning a satellite uh, above the equator uh, at an altitude of almost 36,000 kilometers. And because of the orbit of that satellite and the rotation of the Earth, that satellite actually stays in a fixed point in a fixed position above the Earth. So if you if you launch it, um, you know above Hawaii, it's always going to stay above Hawaii um, as it do, does its mission and uh, and as the satellite ages. You know these are two orbits. There are a lot of other orbits you can imagine. There's you know me uh, medium Earth orbit, MEO. Uh, that would obviously between there. Uh, there's also now something that that is increasingly talked about, and that is a cis lunar orbit. Cis lunar orbits would be the things that are beyond geo, but inside the moon. And then finally, there are there are even more exotic orbits where we are putting things at uh, something called Lagrange points that are unique uh, points that um, because of the gravitational pull of the Earth, the Moon, and uh, the Sun, um, they can actually, th things that are placed in those positions can actually stay fixed in their orientation to those, to those three bodies. Um, and, and we're increasingly seeing applications of those, what I think of as fairly exotic orbits. Uh, okay, so, um, Historically, how has this worked? So historically, uh, all satellites were large and all satellites were exquisite. 
And uh, in space terms, exquisite is a euphemism that means that they're very sophisticated, they're very complicated, they're very expensive, and they generally have a number of capabilities built into them. So you can kind of think of them oftentimes as the Swiss army knife of satellites. Um, and a couple examples for those that I, that I put in here. Um, one is this satellite that I mentioned uh, that uh, I had a picture of my me and my son uh, watching it get launched. That's the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite, the GOES satellite. Um, there is, uh, uh, at any given time, there are five GOES satellites. Um, GOES are operated by uh, the uh, NOAA NASA. So these are the... Um, um, National Observation of the Atmosphere Organization in the United States, but they really provide coverage of North America from about the pole down to uh, below the equator. They're positioned on the on the uh, geo orbiting side, um, either on the Atlantic side of the continent or the Pacific side of the continent. And every picture that you've ever seen of a hurricane. Uh, like the one in the upper right hand corner uh, of this slide comes from these GOES satellites. Um, GOES satellites are, 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 you know, near a billion dollars. Every one of them has multiple purposes. They do things like not only have the ability to track weather configurations and do th and, and take pictures like of hurricanes. Um, they can also be used for lightning detection to, uh, to, to look for forest fires. Uh, they can they can do things like look at uh, sea temperatures to make predictions about weather. Lots and lots of different things. Um, several hundred million dollars, and the launch of these things is very expensive because they're very heavy and they've got to get to uh, a geosynchronous orbit, which is very far out. Um, I'm very familiar with this satellite because um, we actually build. The, uh, the optical image processing capability on all of these satellites. So we build what's called the payload for that satellite. Um, so, so you look at this, this was uh, how satellites operated for you know, almost 30 years. There were LEO satellites, uh, but not necessarily that many of them. Geo-orbit was, was the place to be. Um, and because it was so expensive, to get a satellite there. You wanted to pack as much as you could into it. And you also wanted to design that satellite generally so it would have a life expectancy well beyond 15 years. Um, so, you know, the other example that I have there is a Viasat satellite. That Viasat satellite is for um, a, a commercial internet as, a, as well as, you know, business internet. Um, it's a geo-orbiting satellite. Um, weighs much more than 5,000 kilos. Um, Viasat 1 um, at this point is 20 years old and it is still in operation. So these things are so expensive, so big that it takes you, uh, uh, you want to really get your money's worth out of them. Uh, I'll highlight the, the example on the bottom because uh, I referred to a number of aspects of it the James Webb Space Telescope. You know, when we look at when that satellite started to be uh, conceptualized, um, it was now over 30 years ago. Um, design started 22 years ago. Construction started um, in about 2005, and it was finally launched to, uh, to a lot of fanfare earlier this year. Again, L3 Harris, our company, we do a lot of these massive op uh, optics. Um, on that satellite, we did all of the optical integration and alignment for that system. That satellite is actually also sitting at one of these Lagrange points, so well beyond the moon. In fact, it's a point that is on the opposite side of the moon, and it orbits around the Earth and the moon, and it stays in that position. So uh, if you had a telescope on Earth, you couldn't actually look and see the James Webb telescope because it's obliterated uh, by the moon. Okay. So these satellites were very expensive, and fundamentally, the reason for that was the cost of launches were, were extremely expensive. So what's changed? Well, it is true that commercial companies came in and, uh, and created uh, a, a fantastic opportunity here, 
Uh, and I see that's one of the questions that I have that I was waiting till this page to get into. Um, you know, private enterprise of building and launching space vehicles rather than NASA. Um, it really is the seismic shift that has changed um, how we use space and how we think about space. Um, so it, it, it used to be that there were very few companies. Um, these were companies like Lockheed uh, and Boeing that would launch uh, satellites, and they were contracted to that primarily by NASA, but, but they did it for by themselves as well. And everybody's now familiar with how SpaceX is launching things. But SpaceX, you know, gets a lot of publicity, but but they are not unique. ULA, United Launch Agency, is a um, is the remnants of a it, it is a, a joint venture between Boeing and Lockheed. So it's those two great space programs that are launching satellites all the time. Um, Virgin Galactic is launching. Um, Blue Origin will start launching in the not too distant future. And Rocket Lab, I, I mentioned that one because it's a, a, a New Zealand company that um, builds a rocket that will launch one very, very small satellite. And um, there you can easily imagine examples where that would be uh, relevant. The big deal about this is if you look at the right hand side of the page, and that is that if I look at these small class of, of, of rockets that can launch things that are under two kilograms, uh, 2,000 uh, 2, kilos to a LEO orbit, the cost per kilo of a launch has dropped from about $125,000 per kilo down to about $25,000 per kilo. And that's with the Electron, which is one of these rocket lab uh, satellites. If I want to launch huge things, things that are more than than twenty thousand kilos, um, then it's then it's even more dramatic. Where we see that you know the space shuttle was at about seventy five thousand dollars per kilo. Um, now a Falcon Nine and a Falcon Heavy are both sitting at about uh, twenty seven hundred dollars per kilo. And with a price drop like that, it really changes the way we think about space. And, and, and how I can use space. And, and what that allows me to do is think about instead of having these massive uh, multi-purpose Swiss Army knife satellites, it allows us to have uh, proliferated LEO. Um, this is pro proliferated low earth orbit satellites where instead of having a single satellite that can do uh, that can do multiple things. You distribute that off of a constellation of smaller satellites. And because those satellites are closer to Earth, you actually have, in many cases, more capabilities. So you think about this uh, on the graphic on the left. Um, we started out probably 20 years ago with this idea of nanosats or CubeSats. These were very small satellites, less than 10 kilos. Because the launch price was coming down, um, universities started building these kind of satellites and launching them. The best commercial example is uh, Planet Labs. Uh, that's a company that does Earth imagery for, for commercial purposes. You can go to their website. And you can buy a picture of your, your house if you want. Um, they started out with very small satellites. And I've been to their factory. And these satellites that they were producing are about the size of a loaf of bread. Now, that said, uh, there was a tremendous push, you know, 20 years ago, and everybody was, was trying to build nanosats and cubesats. But fundamentally, just because they're so, so small and the power that they can generate and use is, is so minimal, um, what we've seen over the years is, is that has migrated to slightly larger satellites. And now we're in this sweet spot of what we call small sats that are in the 100 to 500 kilo range. Um, OneWeb is a great example of that. OneWeb is another low earth orbiting commercial internet capability um, that, uh, that um, uh, is now owned by, by the UK government. Um, but, but that's a satellite that has the size to have the power and capability to really deliver a mission over a number of different years. Um, so, the interesting thing about this shift is that it used to be that organizations like NASA were the ones who were doing Earth Im imagery, 
But now because of this reduction in the cost of launch and the reduction in the cost of satellites, commercial companies have now stepped in and started providing capabilities at a much lower cost and selling them commercially for a number of different purposes. Imagery I've already talked about. Um, synthetic aperture radar is a type of imagery that, that uses um, radar imaging. Um, you know, I would say in that case, I think the jury is still out whether there's a commercial market for that, but I think it's fantastic that we see these things pushing into space. And, and you know, the real example of this uh, that people are probably familiar with is uh, SpaceX Starlink system. Um, their objective is to provide a, a, a fairly low Earth orbit at about 550 kilos. Each of their satellites is 230 or so kilos. Um, and, uh, and they started de development design in 2015. They launched their first 60 satellites in May of 2019. And right now they have more than 3,200 satellites on orbit. Um, ultimately, they plan to have 12,000 satellites in their constellation. And what you can think of this as is just internet from space. And it's very high speed, very high bandwidth, um, uh, achieving speeds of uh, 200 gigabits per second. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll say here that it says there that it's a 3,200 satellites in orbit, um, but that number is always wrong because they are constantly launching satellites. So they launched, uh, they had a plan in August to launch three rockets full. Each rocket carries 60 of these satellites. Uh, they had a plan in August to do three launches in three days. There was a weather problem one day, so they actually succeeded in doing three launches in four days. Um, at this point, you know, I live on, on what I described as the Space Coast. Um, there's, there's launches at a rate uh, of, of at least one a week. Um, if, if the timing had been right, you would have been able to hear a, a launch while I was giving this presentation, but I think the launch is actually scheduled at two o'clock in the morning or so. So you can see that, that, this, that this change in, in, in launch costs has really driven a change in behavior of how we use space. And, and that change has also impacted the way we think about space from a defense purposes. So space has always been thought of as a safe domain. You know, even going back to uh, 1973, um, most of you are probably not old enough to remember this, but uh, there was a program called Apollo Soyuz um, it was shortly after uh, uh, humans walked on the moon that an American spacecraft and a Russian spacecraft actually met in space, docked together, and, uh, and, and the astronauts toured each other's uh, space vehicles. Um, that really was a demonstration that was intended to show that space was a peaceful, uh, a peaceful place. Um, it was in the middle of the heart and the heat of the Cold War, but it was still completed and done. Um, and, and it symbolized the fact that space was a sanctuary and would not fundamentally be used for defense. We still see that today with the International Space Station um, that's occupied by um, people from, from many different nations, um, but but primarily funded by the Russians and, uh, and the Americans. So things are changing. And, and part of why they're changing is because of increases in, in worldwide tension, uh, but also the recognition that uh, because of this shift in space from this exotic position to this um, more uh, reasonably priced and, and commercial um, satellite capabilities. Um, one can start doing a, a variety of different things in space economically. And the way I would think of this is that space can start replacing things that I would do on the ground, like internet, like providing internet instead of having a terrestrial fiber run to your house or a, a microwave tower that broadcasts to your house. You can do that from space. Um, but, but it's also the case 
that um, it's taking over airborne operations. So airborne operations that were done like uh, imagery, um, the synthetic aperture radar has traditionally been done for the air. So there are a number of different capabilities that can start being pulled up in space and be do and doing that very economically. So every country on earth now has recognized that um, space is, is a contested place. Um, it's certainly a, a key part of the US's national defense uh, strategy. It's also a very key part of Canada's defense policy. Uh, and the fundamental reason is that again, things are evolving so quickly and we haven't really understood just what the potential is in space. But I can promise you that it is getting um, evolving at a pace that is, that is really uh, quite remarkable. And I'll hit on that on, on this slide. You know, you know I talked about uh, SpaceX launching more than 3,200 satellites over the last three years. Those are pure commercial satellites. Um, China and Russia have actually each increased their defense assets in space by more than 70% over the last two years. And, and space is just simply getting to be a, a much more dangerous place um, with ongoing demonstrations of things like anti-satellite weapons. So the US was the first to shoot down a satellite in uh, 1985. That was actually a, a satellite that had a, uh, a, a very um, a heavy chemical um, propulsion system in it, and it was going to deorbit, was going to come back into the Earth. And, uh, and, and NASA wanted to destroy that satellite so that it wouldn't have uh, the toxic um, nature of the, of the fuel, wouldn't do any damage. Um, that said, it demonstrated that you can blow up a satellite from Earth. And since then, there have been a number of other uh, demonstrations of that from China and most recently from Russia just last year. Um, in this year, the U.S. Uh, committed not to conduct any ASAT tests, anti-satellite weapon tests. Um, Canada and New Zealand signed on to that pact as well. And, and, and I can't overemphasize just how um, destructive these type of tests and this kind of work is. So that Russian satellite, uh, that Russian ASAT test is a very interesting one. It was done uh, last year. Um, in general, when if you've heard the phrase space debris, space debris is something that uh, we generally would say, if I can see it, it's about 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters in size. So this could be a 10 centimeter bolt or a, or a piece of a solar panel or something like that. That Russian anti-satellite test actually created more than 1,500 objects that are 10 centimeters in size. It actually resulted in having to take evasive maneuvers in the International Space Station to keep people safe. So there's increasing um, threat and recognition. You can see that these anti-satellite weapons have been actually increasing in their frequency um, over the last few years. Um, cyber attacks are also increasing. Cyber attacks on the satellites themselves, but also on the infrastructure that's needed to support the satellite. So in fact, uh, in, in uh, February of this year, just before the uh, invasion uh, of Ukraine by Russia, um, Russia actually hacked into the ground terminals for uh, an American satellite internet provider um, that Whose, whose capabilities was being used by the Ukrainian military. Um, it fundamentally shut down the internet for, for Ukrainians, uh, not just in the military, but even their civilians as well. And that was really an unprecedented cyber attack um, that impacted uh, that kind of a capability. Um, you know, this, this context is really what has driven the creation of, uh, of the Space Force in the United States. So if in, in the past, uh, the Air Force was fundamentally responsible for space, uh, but that said, the Air Force was not tasked with doing anything to defend or protect space assets. So the, the Space Force was created in response to what is uh, an increasingly um, threatening environment. Another great example um, of, of the threat to space 
is in uh, the commercial and defense capabilities that are provided by the Global Positioning System, GPS. In general, um, we refer to GPS as a PNT, Precision Navigation and Timing System. Um, GPS just happens to be one example of that. Um, it's the US built example. Um, Russia has, has an example. They built a satellite constellation called GLONASS. Um, China has something called Baidu. Europe has their own constellation, Galileo. Um, and, and all of them fundamentally operate in similar ways. Um, the impact of GPS is probably the most significant space impact um, that's ever been, been achieved. Um, estimates are that GPS uh, provides about $1 billion per day of, of economic impact. Um, I think a great example is the emergence of a precision agriculture industry. Um, so every, every farm implement manufacturer is involved in this, but, but John Deere, for example, um, has resulted in, in, you know, tractors, combines that will result in substantially more fuel efficient coverage of a field uh, with very little human intervention, um, where the overlap for things like seeding and things like that are very, very small and spraying. Um, so the, the, the value of this in fuel efficiency, reduction in time, um, and being more environmentally conscious, it, it just can't be underestimated. Um, on the other hand, uh, there is also a very significant military reliance on, on the GPS system as well. And probably one of the most significant applications of that are, are in the ability to reduce um, uh, reduce fratricide and reduce casualties from weapons. So, you know, going back to the very first Gulf War, there was lots of discussion about these precision weapons that were actually able to take out their target surgically and result in far less casualties. Okay, this is the GPS system. Um, I didn't list any examples of, of threats to the GPS system but they occur effectively every day. So the GPS system in, uh, in Ukraine is disrupted. Um, and it's, it's not that they're shooting down satellites, but it's disrupting the electronic signals. So this is just a radio signal that's coming from the satellites. Um, it's constantly being disrupted. And, and if you think about that in a, in a Ukraine environment where, where there is an, actually a war going on, um, this is also a potential that adversaries uh, and bad actors could do that and disrupt the um, use of this in the economy in Canada or the US or Europe or anywhere else as well. And that recognition is causing a lot of concern and in investigations into how we can prevent those kind of threats in the future. Okay, so you know I've talked about this idea of, of uh, old and exquisite satellites that were heavy, uh, very expensive launch costs, the migration to these lower cost, and really an evolution of how space is being used, um, and and now, and, and as well as then the threat for uh, adversaries and 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 military actions in space. Um, you know, one of the responses to that and the next evolution of, of this change in the way space is treated is what's being referred to as the hybrid space architecture. So it's not just, um, uh, it's not just uh, a, a single satellite that does a single mission, but a collection of disparate satellites that can accomplish a mission in a unique way. Uh, I'll give one great example, and that is the Viasat and Inmarsat. So Viasat is uh, a North American company that provides geosynchronous internet access. Um, consumers can buy it. You can order it. A terminal will come to your house. You can put it in your backyard, point it at the satellite, and you'll have internet from that. Um, Inmarsat is a LEO provider. They do, ge they do a geo, but they are also doing low Earth orbit internet satellites like OneWeb or SpaceX. Um, and the recognition is that these LEO satellites um, are more resilient, uh, but they are also uh, don't have the bandwidth 
Um, and there's other, other, other challenges with them and that uh, uh, they don't have, um, you can't get as many users on those systems because of the architecture and the topology. So really a hybrid of a Leo and a Geo where I want the low latency of Leo. Uh, Leo, I can maybe get a, a, a 25 millisecond latency, which is good enough to even play video games. Uh, but if I'm streaming a movie, it's a waste of the bandwidth of those Leo satellites. So a combination of the two can allow you to start a connection on Leo and then pop it up to a Geo, which is much more cost effective. Um, Another example of a hybrid network is, is the next one, which is 5G interaction with, uh, with uh, something called non-terrestrial networks. So this is putting 5G capability in space. Um, there's been a lot of announcements about it lately. I think um, just over the weekend, Samsung announced that their Galaxy phones will now have the ability to talk with satellites as well. This isn't for making calls. Uh, don't think of it that way at all. It's really about emergency texting capability. So if I'm uh, as a last resort in a place that has no cell coverage, uh, I have an emergency, I will be able to open an app and make a connection through a satellite to, uh, to, to send a signal. Okay. Um, you, you know, I know that this is uh, computer, computer science. Uh, 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 sponsored uh, initiative. Um, so I do want to talk a bit about uh, the importance of software in these things. So when I started on that satellite back in uh, 2006, 2007 timeframe, it was amazing to me that if we wanted to upload a new patch or a new software build, the uplink was not fast enough to actually achieve that. It would take multiple orbits um, and, and and have multiple batches of upload to get an entire new image on that satellite. Okay, that's not the case today. We can pop up a new satellite image just about any time we want. And so this has changed the way we think about the mission of satellites, get it up there. And, and in our case, you know, when, when we, we will even allow others to put a software apps, you can think of it as the iPhone, where people can put different apps onto our satellites. So continually upgrading the software on these things. The other piece that I would touch on is, you know, when we talk about satellites, we are often very focused, and I, and I will guilty of this as well, on the SpaceX aspect because it is so cool. Um, interestingly, for every dollar spent on space, there's about a dollar spent on the ground segment side of this. So these are the ground stations that control those satellites as well as collecting the data from them. And that's because they have just hundreds of millions of lines of software that are needed to do the processing, the command and control, the telemetry, all of these various things. You know, it's interesting in this new hybrid world, um, in general, you know, NASA for for um, the Artemis spacecraft has its a, a unique ground segment. Um, for the Gozar, there's a unique ground station for that. Um, Microsoft and Amazon have the idea of creating um, generic ground stations worldwide, um, and recognize that for a low Earth orbiting satellite, they could possibly hit five or six satellites every hour. Um, and you don't need to have dedicated ground infrastructure for these things. So again, I think it's a, a fascinating way that the space industry is evolving. And this commercial influence is, um, is absolutely uh, critical to what I think is a great acceleration in a very exciting field. So I'll, I'll wrap up here and, um, and open it up for questions. So again, um, feel free to, uh, to type in a question if you've got it. Um, or, uh, or when I wrap up, I'm happy to have you come off of uh, come off of audio or off of mute and ask a question as well. Hopefully, uh, hopefully there were some things here that sparked an interest. Um, now that said, I think that uh, wrapping up on this slide, um, we are in the in the midst of beyond anything that I would have expected to see in my life. Um, you know, this this shows the the Cape Canaveral Kennedy Space Center launches. 
Um, we're we're going to close out at about 60 launches this year. Again, more than one launch a week. Um, when we began 2020, and, and that 60 launches, probably a third of those are, uh, are SpaceX. So um, that's about... Uh, uh, that's about 1,200 satellites that have been launched um, just this past year. Um, more than 1,000 uh, satellites have been, have been put into orbit, and that's more than you know, the first 50 years of, of the space age. Um, it's also interesting that we're just seeing so many more launch companies and launch vehicles. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a floor as to how inexpensive this can get. Um, but, you know, if you're thinking about getting into the space industry, you know, I, I often um, I often regretted missing the early days of the space industry. Uh, I no longer do. I think we're in the most exciting era of the space industry because there is so much opportunity um, and and it will only grow with uh, with pictures like this. So I'll stop there and uh, and and open it up for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Ross. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand or type into the chat. Okay, there's a question. Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, who keeps track of all- uh, Microsatellite or something. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, so, could you explain any use case that you could uh, see for students to contribute into building a satellite? Uh, so, what sort of use case do you do you think we can uh, you can come up if you know anything? If you yeah, can share. so 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 it's interesting that um, if I if I look back on the early days of these of these very small satellites. Um, the, fundamentally, what they were trying to do was just a proof of concept. It's almost going back to Sputnik, just, you know, universities and it, individuals wanted to launch something. And even if it was just uh, transmitting a ping, people were pretty excited about that because the barrier to entry into getting into this had dropped so far. Um, now, now, uh, the capability demand, we, we all believe that, you know, anybody you know the collection of us on this on this Zoom call could get together and uh, and pool our money and easily be able to design and launch a small satellite that could you know ping as it goes around the Earth. Um, now the challenge is what can you pack into a small size capability like that? Um, one of the examples that I would give um, is a company called um, Hawkeye Three Hundred and Sixty that have launched uh, a handful of small satellites that do what is called signals intelligence. Um, so fundamentally what they are doing is over a, uh, a, a large frequency band looking for radio transmission. And you can think, okay, so what's the value of that? Um, well, one of the values of that is you can actually track traffic uh, patterns with uh, by the radio signals. So you can actually track uh, on mass movements of cell phones. You can uh, track uh, vessels at sea that are transmitting. Um, and there's actually a commercial market for that very rudimentary data because it's not available anywhere else. And a satellite uh, such as that um, could be in the category of several hundred thousand dollars and actually generate a commercial return. Um, so I'll be honest that a lot of these kind of very interesting niche areas are already being exploited uh, by, by commercial companies um, and universities. But you know, I, I think that I, I, would, I would love to see people thinking about more opportunities to spend small amounts of money and do very interesting niche things like that in space. I don't think we're done yet. You know, another great example is um, I think that uh, space access is going to blow open the Internet of Things market. 
So probably most people now have, you know, smart, smart light bulbs that they can control with their iPhone and things like that. Um, fundamentally, all those little smart devices still need to be very near to a Wi-Fi connection. If we want to have an expensive one, maybe I can put a cellular SIM card into it and put it out somewhere. Um, but if I wanted to do some kind of a science experiment where I, I want to fly over a forest and check on soil, soil temperatures, and I just want to distribute a whole bunch of little tiny, very low cost, um, very low transmission capability uh, devices that can measure soil content, um, the easiest way to do that is to have satellite Internet of Things receivers. I think those satellites are very economical. And there are things like that that universities could certainly get involved in. Great question. You know, there was a question at the chat uh, from Don on uh, who keeps track of all these orbits and is permission uh, required? Um, so first of all, no, there is no permission required. Um, there is no, you know, international consortium that uh, makes decisions on, on orbits. Um, right now, we are still living in uh, a bit of a wild west. Um, it was somewhat, it, it was actually very controversial that SpaceX started launching their satellites and decided to put them at the 550 kilometer orbit. Um, so SpaceX needed to get permission to use the RF frequency. Um, so in fact, every country that, that SpaceX operates in, they need to get a license to use a radio frequency, but no one gives them permission on where to launch satellites. Um, obviously, countries can exercise influence, but they don't give them permission or deny permission. Um, there's general practices on the geo belt. Um, people don't want satellites too close to one another. And so there is a catalog of, of, of satellites on the geo belt. And, and people are now squeezing satellites in closer and closer together. Uh, there, I would say that there's a general agreement and people kind of make it known that they're heading for a particular slot to avoid congestion. Uh, but in the rest of the orbits, there isn't. Um, and uh, there's a number of different programs um, that, are, that are designed to keep track of, of, the, of the objects in space, as I say, you know, down to about uh, 10 centimeters. I don't have the latest uh, numbers on that, but there are certainly at this point, you know, many, many tens of thousands of objects being tracked. Other question. So is there any effort to clean up some of those small objects floating around? Not yet. And um, so, so there's lots of discussion about this, but you know, it, it sounds trite, but um, but but you know, people at NASA and and elsewhere say this all the time. Space is really, really big, and um, you know, how one would even go about um, attracting space junk and debris and figuring out how to collect it. You know, we can't even do that with the ocean. So, so how are we going to do that in space? Um, there's been discussion of programs to do something like that, uh, but but we haven't really got consolidated on any economical or practical way of doing it. You know, the fear is that um, uh, if if there was um, any more uh, damage done to satellites, either through an anti-satellite um, test or something like that. Um, it, I, I could imagine a scenario, one can even do a calculation on how much debris you need up there before space is unusual, un, unusable, where it's just too, uh, too damaged and, and there's too much junk flying around. And that's gonna be there for, for you know, hundreds of years until things deorbit. Another question online I see was uh, from Susan was, what are some of the programming languages being used? Um, it still is um, C++ is, is the most common, but um, don't think that, that you know, we're not using things like um, 
you know Python and uh, and and JavaScript and all those other things as well. Um, it used to be that you needed to have an extremely efficient programming language. Um, oh, and, 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 and there is COBOL. There is every language known known to the human race up in in uh, space on something. Um, but fundamentally, it used to be that we wanted very very efficient because you know everything in space costs more. Um, there's a lot of radiation. Processors have to be rad hard. Memory has to be rad hard. These are extremely expensive. Um, so so you you keep it as compact as you possibly can. Um, and so, you know, efficient languages are are kind of the focus. So 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 Daryl, I see we're at the top of the hour. Uh, if there are any questions, um, maybe we, maybe we stop there. That sounds good. So, help me thank our speaker again. I know there's virtual hands <laughs> clapping to put up as well. So great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Daryl, for the invitation. And uh, thanks, everybody, for your interest. Great. Thanks again. And keep an eye out for our next event. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And everybody have a great holiday.